My name is Max Lugavere. I'm a health and science journalist and the author of Genius Foods, Become Smarter, Happier, and More Productive While Protecting Your Brain for Life. It's an owner's manual for your brain to make your brain work better so that you feel better, you have more energy, uh, you feel happier, while also minimizing your risk for some of America's most feared diseases, like Alzheimer's disease. So a couple of years ago, it was at that exact time that my mom began showing signs of memory loss. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but those were the earliest symptoms of what uh, inevitably um, became a mysterious form of dementia. You know, after going around the country with her to various uh, neurology departments, I became basically unable to focus on anything but um, research and understanding to the best of my ability how diet and lifestyle may have contributed to what I was seeing develop in my mom. So I moved from Los Angeles, where I was living at the time, back to New York. I just became really interested in uh, digging into PubMed and um, learning everything I could about dementia, the etiology of dementia, um, you know, wh what will cause a person to become demented, uh, all the various forms of dementia, as well as other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. And I became really interested in what at the time was a fairly novel idea that nobody was talking about, dementia prevention. Certain forms of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of it, begins in the brain decades before the first symptom of memory loss. 30 to 40 years by some calculations and some evidence suggests even earlier than that. And I realized that all this time I had been thinking of dementia as an old person's disease, and I realized that I was completely wrong, that dementia begins in the brain far earlier than the emergence of symptoms. And suddenly I became really interested in what I could do to protect my own brain. Nobody was talking about it at the time. And I wanted to, you know, on the one hand, um, learn as much as I possibly could, uh, and on the other hand, spread this information, because I felt like it was something that people really needed to be talking about. I decided to do a documentary called Breadhead, which would, on the one hand, allow me to create a work that would speak to my generation um, about this topic. And on the other hand, it would give me the sort of ability to call up some of the top researchers in the world. So, I mean, I reached out to researchers at Harvard, Brown, Cornell. Um, I went overseas and I've you know, visited labs in Berlin, Germany, in Stockholm, Sweden in Helsinki, Finland. Redhead really is uh, its a feature-length documentary to sort of wrap all these insights together um, and present um, as a work uh, this really compelling case that our cognitive destiny is within our control for the vast majority of uh, dementia cases. Over the course of that journey, I learned a lot about the brain and nutrition and about lifestyle factors like light exposure, sleep, exercise, and as focused as I was for so long on Alzheimer's and dementia prevention, inevitably I learned a lot about what makes the brain work best. You know, whether we're talking about depression, which many people consider to be a moral failing, or an inability to focus, the same. You know, so many people find that, you know, when they're stuck behind their desks for nine hours a day, their inability to focus on their work is somehow reflective of a problem with their brains. I realized that so much of the way, the ways in which our brains function and operate on a moment to moment basis is dictated by our diets and by our lifestyles. And so that really gave birth to Genius Foods, which is, um, you know, my book that is really an all in one comprehensive deep dive into everything that you need to do to make your brain work at its best. Nutrition, what we eat, how we live our lives, this is something that I think we should all become experts in without question. Doctors are not authorities on nutrition. This is a fact. Most of the doctors that I've spoken to get a couple of hours over one afternoon uh, in regards to nutrition training, and that nutrition training that they get is usually outdated and you know, not fully evidence-based. And the same goes for nutritionists. Um, and so while I have utmost respect for people that decide to go into that as a career path, the dietary guidelines that we are seemingly force-fed, no pun intended, in this country are not evidence-based. I mean, today, we're still advised to, you know, include whole grains, for example, at every meal. That's what the USDA, the USDA MyPlate uh, dietary paradigm uh, 
uh, implores us to do, to include grains at every meal. That's not an evidence-based recommendation. The latest research, a meta-analysis performed by Cochrane, which is an organization known for their unbiased, uh, systematic reviews of, of health literature in partnership with the World Health, health Organization, found that there's no good evidence when looking at randomized controlled trials, which are the kinds of trials required to prove cause and effect, that whole grains improve health. So why are we eating them? As filler? As if we're like, you know, feedlot cows? No. What I want to eat, you know, I want, you know, my diet to be dictated by the kind of diet I might have consumed or my ancestors might have consumed during which our brains evolved. For millions of years, the food supply on this planet was a certain way. And, you know, the first iteration of the human species ate in a way that caused our brains to evolve. About 10,000 years ago, we turned our backs on that diet, and over time, our brains actually lost the, volume, the volumetric equivalent of a tennis ball. And that shift was called the agricultural revolution, which ultimately paved the way for the fact that today, 60% of the calories that we consume worldwide come from three plants. There are 50,000 edible plant species on Earth. Today we consume most of our calories, wheat, corn, and rice. These plants are great for growing a population, supplying cheap energy, but they're very nutrient poor, and there's nothing in them that our brains <clears throat> require, ultimately. There's no you know, human biological requirement for grains, for corn, for rice, for wheat. The awareness around Alzheimer's disease is really fueled by a few organizations that fund research and their ability to raise funds is in you know in a large part fueled by the fear surrounding the disease as long as we feel helpless and hopeless and that there's no cure in sight we're going to continue to put money into these organizations that fund research towards a pharmaceutical cure and that research really over the past couple of uh, decades has been um, dictated by you know, one governing hypothesis as to why Alzheimer's disease develops in the brain. It's called the amyloid hypothesis, that there's this plaque in the brain that ultimately causes Alzheimer's disease, and if we're able to remove that plaque from the brain, we'll be able to cure the disease. Unfortunately, Alzheimer's drug trials have a 99.6% fail rate. In looking at the research in terms of prevention and all that stuff, although I never felt like that was at odds with the quest for a cure, and in fact I support fully the quest for a cure. If there was a pharmaceutical pill that would emerge that I could give my mom tomorrow to cure what she has, I would do it in a second. Well, I would say the biggest myths surrounding Alzheimer's disease and brain health in general is that we can't do anything to affect our odds or to change our brain health. AARP did a study in uh, 2015 that found that more than 90% of Americans believe that brain health is really important yet largely are in the dark in terms of how to maintain or improve it. So most people uh, don't really know how to improve brain health and don't really understand that Alzheimer's disease is something that we can potentially prevent. People that know me, that spend time with me, I'm vigilant in my dietary choices. Um, you know, my mom is sort of has been a guinea pig for a while, but uh, it's hard to undo the dietary dogma that's been sort of nailed in, drilled in over decades by, you know, the powers that were when my mom was really coming about and forming her dietary habits. My mom is still largely afraid of fat and cholesterol. Um, she still doesn't believe that there's anything inherently harmful about going through a whole bag of fat-free pretzels on the couch as she watches TV. To her, the metaphor that Fat can clog your arteries the same way that it does to a drain when you pour grease down a cold drain. That metaphor is very powerful. It's, it's so simplistic and it makes so much sense from a logical standpoint. But biology often defies logic. And, um, you know, trying to communicate that to her has been really difficult. For one, because of just the fact that, you know, it's, it's her age, it's her son that's trying to tell her how could her son possibly know more than her. Um, thankfully, she's sort of a little bit, you know, she's seen that I r I've written a book, so that to her gives me a little bit of credibility, thankfully. <laughs> but yeah, it's also she has dementia, so it's, um, it's hard for her to, to make those choices for herself. And she has, um, you know, for eight hours a day, a uh, health, you know, a home health aide 
and you know that aide is untrained when it comes to nutrition. So she's doing she's doing much better dietarily now, and she's been pretty stable. Um, thank God. I think probably the most impactful thing that one can do is um, practice a variety of different types of exercise. You know, aerobic exercise uh, doesn't have to be done in the gym. I try to imbue my day with as much movement as I can, whether it's taking the stairs when given the opportunity, riding a bicycle whenever I can, um, or just, you know, picking up the pace as I'm walking through the city. You know, movement is really good in terms of increasing blood flow to the brain. Um, releasing uh, protective growth factors in the brain, like uh, something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is sort of called by some to be the miracle grow for the brain. It helps fortify your brain with new brain cells. And in general, what's good for the body is good for the brain. Just moving um, helps to mobilize fluids throughout the body that don't have their own heart. And, you know, a perfect example of that is the body's lymphatic system. And it was recently found that the body's lymphatic system is directly connected to the brain. And this is sort of the, the body's waste disposal uh, system of ducts, and it's, it's connected to the brain. So in terms of, you know, minimizing uh, exposure to waste products, flushing them through the body, movement is vital. Anaerobic exercise, so high intensity, you know, weight training, so important for men and for women. Um, high intensity interval training, uh, really important. It was recently found that um, in young, healthy people who are already thought to be at their peak cognitive prow prowess, high-intensity interval training was enough to not only boost cognitive function, but increase the expression of BDNF. So, you know, previously aerobic exercise was really sort of uh, hailed as being the chief way of uh, increasing this protein in the brain. But now we know that, you know, weightlifting, high-intensity um, interval training is a really efficient way of doing the same thing. Building muscle, building muscle strength from a hormonal standpoint is one of the best things that you could do to maintain your body's sensitivity to insulin. It also is sort of like increasing your credit limit in terms of giving you more leeway to consume foods that are higher in carbohydrate. Um, typically, you know, when we consume foods that are high in carbs, those carbs are either going to be burnt off in the moment or they're going to be stored, either in your muscle or your fat tissue. You know, your muscle tissue has a finite storage capacity for glucose, whereas you can store virtually an unlimited amount of fat. So if we're consuming a lot of carbs and we're not active and we don't have, you know, relatively large muscle or, you know, at least um, enough for our body size, I mean, that, that, those, that extra glucose is going to get turned into fat. Dietarily, I think, you know, one of the biggest uh, things for me, just in terms of how I eat has been liberating myself from the no notion that we have to eat every three to four hours uh, per day. You know, I became interested in fitness and in health at a time when the, the guiding uh, philosophy was that to stoke the metabolic flame, you had to sort of eat you know, every three hours. Protein, carbs, fat. Metabolic chamber studies, which is when people basically get told to live in a room that measures their um, calorie expenditure, has found that whether we're eating, you know, three to four meals throughout the day, or we concentrate those meals into two or three, uh, or even one, you know, there's very little metabolic difference, if any. That's been very liberating, and it also reduces decision fatigue. You know, if we're trying to eat really healthily six times a day, that becomes really hard, you know? Whereas if we get to basically decide our meals twice a day, or three times a day, you know, it reduces that fatigue. It makes shopping a lot easier. And I think for people living in the real world, I mean, that's, that's a non-trivial benefit of eating fewer meals. The same diet that's going to uh, put you at increased risk for depression and make you more depressed and more anxious, um, this is not just about correlation, this is about actual research showing that, you know, eating a crappy diet actually affects the way that you think. That's also the same diet that seems to accelerate brain aging and accelerate plaque deposition, the same plaque that's related to Alzheimer's disease um, and Parkinson's disease. It's one human diet. It's not, you know, a diet for the heart, you know, that's different from a diet for the brain. There are certain nutrients that are, you know, studied to be very powerful in regard to brain function, and we highlight those in the book. Um, but in terms of, like, the whole foods that, that promote a healthy brain, an optimal brain, those, are also, those foods are also going to make your heart kick more ass day to day. They're also the foods that are going to, 
you know, reduce indigestion and, you know, make sure that you're the microbiota, the 30 million trillion, rather, microbes that live in your large intestine are kept happy. When it comes to Alzheimer's prevention, it's not about just one food. There's not a single food that's going to prevent Alzheimer's disease for you, but it's about the diet. It's about, you know, what you're eating day to day, how you're living day to day. But in terms of specific foods that um, are powerful uh, brain boosters, I mean, let's take avocados. I think it's funny that avocados are shaped like a bomb, if you think about it, because I consider avocados as being the perfect food to drop a bomb on inflammation and oxidative stress. They're also packed with really important carotenoids, uh, which are pigments. Um, in the case of avocado, it's lutein and zeaxanthin, which have been shown to actually boost processing speed in the brain and make your brain cells work more efficiently. Um, but the problem is uh, those carotenoids need fat to be properly absorbed. Well, in an avocado, an avocado is loaded with healthy fat in the form of monounsaturated fat, oleic acid. It's rich in dietary fiber. It's packed with potassium. You know, researchers speculate that our hunter-gatherer ancestors ate four times the potassium uh, over the course of the day that we eat today because potassium is rich in fruits and vegetables and things like that. Well, an avocado has twice the potassium of a banana. So it's just an incredible all-in-one um, health food. My recommendation in Genius Foods is to eat uh, half to a whole avocado every single day. An avocado is not going to help you prevent Alzheimer's disease. If you're eating a whole avocado every day on top of a crappy diet, it's not going to move the needle for you in terms of Alzheimer's prevention. You know, I also want to be very uh, careful in terms of um, misleading people, you could still do everything right according to the book and still develop Alzheimer's disease. We don't know everything about the disease. Um, and you know, there could still be a to be discovered genetic risk factor that has a determinant effect. The most well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene that we know about is the APOE4 allele. And 97% of people that develop Alzheimer's disease develop it because of the interplay between that risk gene and the choices that they make in their lives. But there could be a, a to-be-determined gene that circumvents all of our best efforts. By doing everything right, we're helping stack the odds in our favor. Okay? It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. We, you know, there is still um, genes which weigh in on you know, our health outcomes. Uh, to some degree, but for the most part, genes are not destiny. In terms of that insurance that we can sort of buy today, um, as we await greater clarity in terms of research and nutrigenomics and pharmacogenomics, these are absolutely meaningful changes and foods that have a meaningful impact on your mental health, your brain health, and your risk for Alzheimer's disease. I think removing the, the processed junk foods from your diet is probably the most, the most important step. Um, and you could do that, that in tandem with adding in the genius foods. The notion of eating everything in moderation is, that's, that's terrible advice to give somebody because we live in a world where we are faced with foods and food choices every day that are literally not designed to be consumed in moderation. They're designed to be over-consumed. The way to stop consuming them is really to try to wean yourself off of them. And it might be difficult for the first two weeks as you, you know, go into withdrawal. A lot of these foods promote withdrawal because you know, they light up our brain's reward centers in a way that no whole food can do by itself. It's really important to get yourself off of that drip because um, at a certain point, you'll cross a line where you don't even crave them anymore. Try to have just a handful. You can't. I mean, that notion of once you pop, you can't stop, that's a truism with scientific backing. That, you know, there are people that, are, that make a lot more money than me sitting in labs that are literally working 9 to 10 to 12 hours a day trying to figure out the best combination of, you know, ingredients that are going to hook you to their product, that are going to make that bag of chips that eat that you eat, or that pint of ice cream, uh, something that just disappears before your very eyes. Diversity, you know, in terms of the hunter-gatherer diet, probably a very good thing. Diversity, dietary diversity in the modern supermarket, not a very good thing. If I get something that was uh, not listed as being fried and it comes to my table as being fried, for example, deep fried, I will return it. You know, you have to be a market disciplinarian. A lot of people like to just kind of, you know, not stir the pot. 
I think you got to stir the pot. You know, uh, we've got too much to lose.